All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for this No to the Recall, Yes to Progress Town Hall. Um, I'm Irene Gao, the Executive Director of Courage California. We're an organization fighting for a more progressive California with over 1.5 million members around the state and nation. So before we get started, I'd like to do an indigenous land acknowledgement. Courage California acknowledges our presence on the traditional and unceded territory of hundreds of First Nations who are the traditional caretakers of this land we call California. As visitors on this land, we pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, relatives, and future generations. So I'd like to thank this, evening, this evening's co-hosts, um, Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment Action, Black Women for Wellness Action Project, California Donor Table, California League of Conservation Voters, CHISPA, Consumer Attorneys of California, NARAL Pro-Choice California, Voices for Progress, and Women Against Recall. And you'll be hearing from several uh, representatives from those co-hosts tonight. ASL interpretation for tonight is provided by Selena Flowers and Susan Pacheco Correa of Pro Bono ASL. So tonight is about the recall, but it's really about all of us. The recall election is part of our battle for the soul of the state and the one that we've been fighting for as long as we've been a state. This recall is a choice about who we wanna be as a state and it's important for us to demonstrate the power of our diverse and progressive majority here in California. We have to move forward with courage, compassion and great urgency to address climate change, protect our workers and families and dismantle white supremacy. Courage California joined this fight against the recall in March to protect a governor who has delivered on some key wins for our state and to call all Californians into this campaign to defeat the recall and keep us on a pathway to progress. I want our state to be defined by how we take care of each other and continue to lead the nation on policies for clean air and water, single payer health care, secure and quality jobs, fair and just taxation and reparations and repatriation of land to native communities. We did not elect President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris in 2020 to then turn around and elect a Trump ally into the governor's office in 2021, not on our watch. That's why we're saying no to the recall, yes to progress. So we've got a packed program for you tonight. Uh, we wanna give you the information and tools that you need to vote no on the recall and mobilize other voters to do the same. As you all know, you've likely seen a lot of the, the polls and the media that this election is going to come down to turnout. And turnout depends on energy and engagement. We can all do more to reclaim this recall battle and build progressive momentum to head into the critical 2022 midterms and big policy fights. So tonight we'll share some of the results of a statewide youth poll that Courage California conducted in the past month in partnership with Data for Social Good, Communities for a New California, and Inland Empire United. We'll hear from a panel of community partners in San Diego Supervisor Nora Vargas and Assemblymember Alex Lee on what's at stake and what we can do on the recall. Then we'll do a quick Q&A before I turn it over to some of our partners and the Newsom Stop the Republican Recall campaign to offer get out the vote volunteer opportunities. So before we get into the program, uh, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, as you'll see, we already have a question, a few questions come in, but please submit questions at any time using the Q&A function that you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So we may answer some questions in the chat as we go if they're pretty straightforward. Um, and of course, we, we may not be able to get to all of your questions tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, another big thing to note, of course, this is a really hot topic, uh, one where people have very strong emotions on all sides. So we welcome comments, but I, I do wanna be clear that we won't tolerate any inner, inappropriate or disparaging, disparaging language in the chat or in the Q&A forum. So we will remove anyone who violates this policy. Uh, so let's get into it. Again, like you're gonna hear from a lot of folks, um, a lot of information and a lot of um, motivation. And so I wanna turn it over to our first guest tonight. I'd like to introduce um, Jose Luis Bedoya and Lisa Garcia Bedoya of Data for Social Good. They're going to be the ones to share the results of our statewide youth poll to kick us off. Um, Jose and Lisa. Thank you so much, Irene, and thanks to everyone for having us today and for being here. I'm going to give you a few um, sort of a framing for the poll while Jose Luis puts the, the slides up. So this is a poll that was in the field from July 19th to August 1st. It was online only. 
Um, it was sent to registered voters aged 18 to 29 that have emails as part of the voter file with oversamples of Black, Latino, and AAPI voters in California. We had uh, 2,345 respondents to the poll, and the, the results have been weighted to reflect all California registered voters aged 18 to 29. Um, I do think as a framing for understanding people's answers to the poll is to just remember what this generation has been through. So the oldest of these voters were age 16 in 2008 when the financial system collapsed and the Great Recession began. Since then, they've had uh, the movement for Black lives, um, results of climate change, the Trump administration, wildfires here in California, a global pandemic, uh, uprising regarding racial reckoning, and more wildfires. And so I think that the answers to this poll really reflect just the tumult that has been um, a big part of the lives of these, of these young voters. And I think they reflect a general distrust of the political system and who's in office. Um, we don't find a lot of excitement about Newsom, but we don't find a lot of excitement um, in terms of, of getting rid of Newsom either. And there, is a, there are a lot of undecideds you will see. And so I think that the takeaway from this is that these are folks that are really hungry for a new kind of politics and that there is tremendous opportunity um, to create a new narrative about what the progressive vision of the future for California could be. And with that, I will turn it over to Jose Luis Bedoya. Excellent, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Thank you. So let's get into it. A um, couple of questions that we want to start with, which is the poll characteristics. Who are they? Who answer the questions? And how do they reflect the state of California? So what we have in front of us is basically the youth universe. This gives you a sense of you know, who we actually had to choose from in order to uh, fill our poll. Here you can see that uh, 18 20 to 29 year olds um, are, are about 4.2 million registered voters. Affiliation is mostly democratic with, which, uh, with about 2 million. NPP is 1.2. Um, Republicans are about 613 and other is 9%, as you can see. If all things go well, 48% uh, would be uh, 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 close to a win for uh, the Democrats. But again, we need some folks from the MPP side as well as other to come in. Gender is about 50% to 47. Other is uh, 3%. Marital status, most people at this age are, are single, not married. Uh, you can see on table one is the voter uh, frequency for this universe, as well as the uh, uh, table two, which is the, uh, um, the uh, race uh, category. Okay, so how did we do with respect to, you know, our, our poll and how does it reflect um, California? So the overall universe is the numbers that I just mentioned in the, on the slide previous. The column that says poll is how we came out in terms of, you know, numbers. So let me know we came out 30%, a little bit under white, we're right on. Uh, Asian, we're overrepresented. African American, we're overrepresented. Other, we're right on, on the mark. And in terms of female uh, to male, uh, females answer the poll more than uh, males, as well as you know non-gender or non-binary gender. Uh, from a participation perspective or partisanship perspective, um, here's how the poll broke out on the chart on the right. So as you can see, slightly more democratic. Uh, Republicans right on NPP. Um, a little bit under and other a little bit under. So overall, we came pretty close to the uh, representation and where we, we, where we didn't, we then adjusted on our side. Okay, so um, we asked the question, you know, how do you think of yourselves? So again, we have the, we have the labels of Democrat, Republican, MPP, all these kinds of different labels, but we also wanted to see how people self-identified. So in this case, Somewhat liberal and very liberal were 44%. Those, those, those are the two biggest categories. And then one interesting category, which is uh, kind of a continuation of the MPP category is I don't think of myself in these terms. So just some information for us to, to think about as we go through the poll. Now, one of the key things that we wanted to ask people is, you know, what is your key issue? And so for youth, at least at this point, the environment. The environment is number one, far and beyond everything else. Jobs in the economy, housing, et cetera, are, are far second, as you can see. Now, we did try to get a little bit of a sense, you know, dig a little bit under and see if there's other issues with respect to the environment. So if you answer the environment, it's basically that people are concerned about uh, climate change. So that's the number one issue. That's the reason why the environment. 
So it's not, um, you know, a, a, as we've recently heard uh, the UN reports where, you know, we're close to a very uh, red uh, mark or a dangerous mark, um, you know, rightfully youth are, are concerned about where they're gonna end up in, in terms of the future that we're gonna leave them and the environment we're gonna leave them. Okay, uh, how will youth engage? So let's talk about how they're interested. So 43% um, answer the question, and how interested are you in this, uh, in this, recall, this year's recall election of Governor Newsom? So 43% were either extremely or somewhat interested, and only 23% said somewhat uninterested or, un or extremely uninterested. Now, again, 22%, um, that middle category is going to swing things, and this is a message we're gonna, you're going to see a lot in the poll. That's the, the folks that we're trying to convince. Now, Honestly, 11% said I didn't know there was a recall, which I, I, I thank people for saying that because it, it gives them a sense of, you know, uh, gives you a sense of where people's minds are. Now, we asked them, do you plan on voting if they were held, uh, you know, uh, if that's scheduled, you know, um, then 59% uh, of people said uh, that they were interested in voting in the recall. So that's a good mark in terms of, you know, trying to make sure that there's some interest there. So that's the good news. The bad news is that we still have 30% that are not interested. Now, I see that as an opportunity to then bring about some additional folks in there to make sure that you have the numbers necessary to uh, vote no. Now, uh, we wanted to show you a little bit of an interest by race. So here you can see that it varies tremendously. So you have interest in terms of all the Asian categories. We had a number of Asian categories. We uh, put them together for this um, uh, summary. 51% said, yes, they're interested. Whites, 63, black, 48, Latinx, 57, and other, 62. So there's a good amount of interest, uh, a little low on, in perhaps in the black category, but I see that as an opportunity because 36% are still not yet decided. Again, some of the good news and you know some of the uh, challenges that we have to face, 43% said that uh, uh, no, they would not recall the uh, governor, so that's good. Uh, but 32% uh, still don't know. So that's one of the categories that I think that organizations like yourselves have an opportunity to bring about the, the, the change and put that push that over 50%. So again, going back to the uh, initial interest, uh, so if you do you plan on voting in the recall election that is scheduled to be held on September 14th? So we wanted to know if they were planning uh, if they were planning to vote, which way they, would they vote? So what we saw is that of that 59%, 36% said yes to the recall, 45% said no, and 19% said I don't know. So the good news is that no to the recall is leading, but perhaps not at the you know wide enough majority or perhaps not at the 50% majority that we would like to avoid some of these uh, you know secondary tertiary um, notions of who should lead our state. So the I don't know yet represents an opportunity for us to uh, go out there and make, um, you know, convince folks to come back uh, to our site. So we wanted to also ask in terms of, you know, who, if the recall were held today, who would you vote for uh, to, um, would you vote to recall Governor Newsom and remove him from office? We wanted to ask the quite same question by race, but it seems like at least from, from the information that we have at this point from the poll, uh, the Latinx uh, folks would be most interested in, in voting no, if, or um, I don't know yet, but they seem to they seem to be the most interested in in supporting the governor at this point. Now, one of the questions that we wanted to ask people is where do you get your information, and you know how who do you trust? What's your what's your most trusted uh, place? And so. We asked a number of questions, a number of categories, anywhere from online research to streaming sources to church mosques, et cetera, et cetera. What we found is that this generation seems to be a little bit more of self-supporting. They, they want to do things on their own. They want to do their own research. So online research was the first category, number one. The second uh, of that was print, radio, and TV podcasts. So they, want, they have a sense of wanting to get the information on their own and then verifying that through maybe some uh, additional means of uh, more reputable uh, source. And then what we asked them is, you know, which platforms do you use? You know, what platforms do you use and check daily specifically? So YouTube, Instagram were by far the number one categories. They're kind of the first category of things. Second category is Facebook to Reddit, as you see. Um, and then you have a tertiary category, which is 
more of a utilitarian, um, you know, tool, a uh, Twitch, uh, a WhatsApp, et cetera, or in some cases, none of the above. So I think that's it for us. And we wanted to leave a little bit of room. I know that Lisa's answer uh, for Q&A, Lisa's answering some of those questions online. If you have further questions, please let us know. You can put them in the chat or use the Q&A function. I do want to answer, give a little bit more context too. So um, Courage has been partnering with Communities for a New California Data for Social Good and Inland Empire United on this poll. So it's meant to be an ongoing poll so that we really understand um, youth voters better and also start to identify trends. It just so wonderfully happened to be a good coincidence that the first poll that we put out in the field was uh, right before the recall. And so we took advantage of that to understand how you were feeling about the recall. Um, and of course, you know, again, there's a lot of polls out there, but this is the only poll that we've seen so far that has really been dedicated to youth and, and has spoken about the recall. So if you have any further questions, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat. Jose Luis and Lisa will be with us for a little bit and also feel free to uh, put them in the Q&A as well. Um, so thank you, Jose Luis and Lisa. I know I especially appreciate it. I know you guys are on vacation. Uh, so thank you so much for working on this poll with us. I appreciate your partnership um, and very lovely to have you guys on this call. Um, not from your usual uh, workstations as well. So thank you so much. Um, if folks want to learn more about this, uh, Courage, will we will be putting out a memo and a press release about some of these polling results and some of the analysis. And as I mentioned, that some of them speak directly to the recall, and some are also just about sort of broader concerns and sort of trends and behaviors of, of youth registered voters around the state as well. So uh, and now I'd like to introduce, we have a panel of community partners who are going to provide more on the ground insights uh, and give a fuller picture of how and why we need to engage our diverse communities on the recall on the issues that matter most to all of us. So joining us tonight are Amy Allison. She's the founder and president of She the People, and she'll be speaking with us on behalf of Women Against the Recall. We have Matt Abular Macias from California League of Conservation Voters, Jairo Cortez from Chispa in the Orange County, and Vanya Quarles from Inland Empire United. So thank you all for speaking with us tonight. So uh, Matt, I wanna start with you. So you saw in our youth poll that the number one issue on their minds, and I would, I'm, I think it's fair to guess that most people's minds is the environment, especially with the report that just came out. And this is, you know, we also know that this is consistent with what we know of our Courage members and Californians in general. So what are, some of the environmental wins that we've had with Governor Gavin Newsom, and how did those wins come about with the partnership of groups like CLCB? Yeah, yeah. You know, again, so much for inviting us to be a part of this, Irene, on Encourage California. Um, Matt Blorch Macias with the California League of Conservation Voters, pronouns he, him. And to answer the question, I'm actually gonna probably start in a place that people don't expect. I mean, it's clear any alternative to um, Ga Governor Gavin Newsom is going to be terrible for the environment. That, like, I th I don't have to probably do a lot of explaining on why that is to you all. Um, Y'all are a smart bunch of people, um, people who are very engaged in what's happening. But I do want to point out some things um, that can help people really understand, like, what 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 the role of the governor would really be, and how that could like change should um, the recall pass. Um, <clears throat> and I would start by also saying that as a progressive and on the environment and on climate change, of course, there's so much we want Governor Newsom to go farther. On. But again, the alternative would be so much worse. Um, so the first thing I'm actually going to start with is actually the appointments that the governor makes and the the and the hirings that they do for essential agencies um, that touch on the environment. A lot of people forget, but the governor has appointments to the air quality management districts or air boards across the state. Um, one such appointment in, that he made um, in office so far uh, for the South Coast District allowed us to get a huge victory of an indirect source rule on warehousing that organizers in the South Coast Basin have been fighting for for a long time. 
that wouldn't have been possible and would not be possible if anybody else was the governor, right? And there's also appointments to CARB, the Air Resources Board, the Public Utilities um, and, um, um, and CalGEM, DTSD, uh, EPA, the Natural Resource Agency. Those are all critical to the environment and protecting our environment, protect, conserving our resources and fighting the climate crisis that we're in, uh, which if you also the IPCC, IPCC report, we're in code red. So we need to make sure that we're not taking any steps backwards on this. Um, so that's one thing that the governor does that would be a big loss for progress on the environment. The second thing, and this actually touches on federal thing, he appointed US Senator Alex Padilla. Alex Padilla, is a champion on climate. He went into DC guns blazing and has been the most vocal US Senator California has had for environmental protection and addressing the climate crisis, period. That's a huge win for the, the climate movement um, and also for Californians. And again, not to like scare people, but should he not get through the recall and something would happen to Senator Padilla, or Senator Feinstein, and that governor needs to make an appointment at that point. If it's not Governor Newsom, and it's one of the alternatives, there goes our progress, our majority in the US Senate for progressive policy and federally. Then to get some more specific environmental policies that Governor Newsom has ordered and or supported, um, start with just some of the executive orders, right? So he signed an executive order that would prohibit the sale of new passenger vehicles, buses, and trucks that use gasoline by 2035 and 2045. Um, he also ordered the end to new fracking permits by 2024, phase out of fossil fuel extraction by 2045, signed an executive order to protect 30% of California's lands and waters by 2030. Those are huge. Those are really big deals. Of course, we need those to be sooner. We want those to be sooner. But Governor Newsom, the governor who actually put this into, okay, the state's going to move forward and do this, right? Um, then other big priorities on the policy that he signed as governor and actually one that he really championed and was a big campaign priority for him and he delivered on was a safe, affordable, safe and affordable drinking water. We know over a million Californians don't have access to safe, affordable drinking water in their homes and schools. And Governor Newsom championed this and made sure that uh, we're changing that. Um, and I'll leave it at that just in the interest of time because I know I went a little long, but there's a couple other things that we could get to um, later on if there's time. But just to say, wrap, to wrap up, Governor Newsom has been great on the environment and it's really an ally um, to the climate movement. Of course, we need to continue to push forward because there's a lot that needs to be done, but that only gets done if we make sure that the recall fails. Thank you, Matt. Um, I appreciate you talking about both the policies and sort of the things that are like more in the weeds or behind the scenes. I think right when um, Biden and Harris were elected, it seemed like every single announcement about an appointment or a nomination was like big news. And it was something that people really discussed, but that is something that we, I mean, even me, I would say as somebody who's very politically engaged, I'm not paying attention to that. Um, and so, I appreciate you especially underscoring about how even these things, very structural things, um, changes that he's been able to make have, have been really important and how they've already translated into change. Now, Vanya, you're in the Inland Empire. You're in one of the regions that is seeing more support for the recall. So what are you seeing and hearing from people there? And what do you see as being at immediately at risk if a recall is successful? Yeah, that's a really good question. I want to first thank you, um, Irene, and, and Courage California for this platform. And yes, I am in the inland region, and um, it's been a hotbed in terms of gathering signatures for the recall. And while we see when issues come to the ballot that we care about, um, the voters usually do the right thing, even when elected leadership doesn't. And so we recognize that there are a lot of dollars coming into this region to make it more likely that there's more support for a recall than not. I think there's ground games um, that people are doing and now people are beginning to become concerned about this. Um, so now we're starting to see the pendulum swing, but they've been organizing in Riverside County and when I say they, I'm referring to uh, Democrats, folks through Ken Calvert's uh, region who have been organizing 
um, for the past year, um, at least for this recall. And so, um, so I think it, it's real. We have a stronghold of Republicans in this county, in this region, who don't want to let go. And if they can unseat um, Gavin Newsom, they can actually change a lot of things for not just the 58 counties, but even in the federal uh, landscape. And I think that's why there's so much at risk in this particular recall. It, we need to push back as people. And I am a member of um, IE United and I sit on the board of IE United. IE United is one of the organizations to make sure as, they, as the young people say, clap back or create a ground game that's gonna change the outcome. Um, so I heard the young people say in the survey, in the poll, that they were kind of lukewarm, not really passionate about Newsom. And most days I feel that same way, but in looking at the potential, the possibility of what could happen to the state of California if he's unseated, that kind of galvanizes me a little bit. Um, and there are some concrete steps that he has taken, of course, for us, not enough, especially when it comes to the area of criminal justice. What I do appreciate are some of the appointments that, that he made. So he appointed uh, Bonta, who was the first Filipino American to sit as the AG for the state of California. And Bonta has a kind of courage and tenacity to call public safety leaders out when public safety leaders break the law. And I thought that was huge. I also thought it was creative to take uh, juvenile justice out of the realm of public safety and put it smack dab into public uh, health and treat it as, as a health issue. I also liked um, actually appointing an uh, appointing uh, Nadine Burks, who was the founder of the ACEs, to kind of show that we realize a lot of the problems in our society that we've been criminalizing aren't actually criminal at all, that they should be in the world of public health. And so, so I appreciate those things. And I'm, I'm warming up, you know, to doing what we need to do um, <laughs> in this recall. You hear me, Matt? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vanya. And I think to put an extra stress on your point, um, I've had the misfortune of, you know, reading and listening to a lot of the talking points of the Republican candidates who are very vocal, very out there. They have a lot more visibility and a lot more momentum behind them. Um, and several of them, whenever, you know, talking about homelessness, other issues, their solution they always offer always seems to be carceral or you know turning to law enforcement and so it's a very like stark picture i think as you're saying so how do you're based in the orange county you know a lot of folks were really focused on orange county in uh 2018 you know like it's famous for sort of like being the home of like ronald reagan and a lot of sort of the right wing um aspect as well so very similar to the inland empire in that way so I'd also love to hear from you, like, what are you hearing, especially working with the Latino youth uh, in the Orange County, and what do you see as being immediately at risk with this recall? Um, I mean, I think, like, similarly to, to like what was shared before, I think, you know, like, for us, like, there is a, a big interest, like, in criminal justice and, like, in policing and police accountability, especially, like, among young Latinxes. Um, and so, you know, like beyond just talking about like some of like the significant like laws that have been passed, like, you know, police, uh, uh, the transparency and police misconduct to through SB 1492, um, updated use of force like standards through AB uh, 392. Um, you know, like there's there's been like significant policy that's been like delivered or like through the legislative process that Governor Newsom like has, has signed. Um, and I think we also can't separate you know, like what a recall of the governor would do to really like chill like the environment around like the progress that we've been making, whether it's been through like legislation, through appointments like that of uh, the, the attorney general, but also through, you know, I think, I think like it's a testament, you know, just, just through of like the conditions that having a more like friendly, right, like governor at the top, like with, with, um, and like that platform, right? Like that can be uh, supportive of like reform efforts. 
I think like it also translates to like the environment that's created for like the ballot measure strategy, right? Because ultimately the governor has a big uh, platform and a big like megaphone. And I can't like imagine, you know, like having, you know, like for, um, you know, like trying to deliver on like criminal justice reform policies, like through uh, like the ballot and having to fight like the governor, you know, exercising that, you know, like that uh, megaphone to, you know, like to speak out against, um, you know, people that like reforms like through the ballot. I think like that's also like really important and something that we can't like lose sight of, like just how important like that actually is. Um, and so like speaking like within like Orange County, right? Like we saw, I think like looking at like the, the polls and looking at like the demographics, um, something like important is like there's sections of Orange County that are like right on like that target population that we're talking about. So if we look at like cities like Santana, like Anaheim, like they're very young cities. Like they're very young cities where like the medium, median age is like um, late twenties, early thirties. And so like, if, you know, like, you know, I think people tend to associate Orange County with like the outside, like the, like the beach cities, maybe like the Northern cities, the canyons. But if we look at central Orange County, that's where a lot of the, votes to like stop this recall like really are and so like we need to invest like in outreach for you know like for young people uh for uh first second generation like um immigrants um and latinos here like in orange county um because that's you know i think i think like certain cities are very loud um but if we have like the ground game um particularly like in central Orange County and invest in these communities, um, we can, you know, like we can definitely like defeat this recall in Orange County. Thank you, Jairo. And I want to lift up something that you said, which is, you know, the alternatives, alternative is if Governor Newsom gets recalled, we're likely going to end up with a Republican governor. And then you have somebody who's like actively fighting against or suppressing the work you're doing. And yes, you know, as, as several folks have mentioned, like Governor Gavin Newsom, most of us want him to go further, but he has left the door open. And I also want to mention that he has actively been in conversation with several groups on the ground um, across issues across different regions because he really wants to work more with our communities. So again, like that open door, that welcoming of our allies, people who have these shared progressive values. And of course, that would be a totally different sort of game if we had a different governor. So Amy, you are so clear and not just about this recall, but in general, you're so clear in speaking to and about the priorities and concerns of women and especially women of color, both with Women Against the Recall and She the People. So what, do you, what long-term repercussions could a recall have for women here in California? Um, uh Thank you for the question. And I want to just uh, say to Heido and um, to Matt and to Vanya uh, that I'm so glad that um, you are engaged in the places that are going to make the biggest difference. Because the truth of the matter is, if we don't focus on the future of California, uh, both regionally and um, uh, young people um, of color who are the majority of people in the state, um, then our politics, our democracy here will suffer and ultimately our issues. Um, I'm the founder and president of She the People, which is a national network elevating the political power of women of color as the core of the Democratic Party. And the reason I'm um, deeply involved with a statewide coalition of women leaders, some 70 organizations, is because when we think about the groups that are going to put, who are going to uh, be the margin are, are women of color, including young women of color, who are um, the majority of women and the strongest Democrats. So uh, I don't believe that this, uh, this election in the next few weeks is about persuasion um, uh, you know, for or against the recall. It's about education and it's turning out the vote. And I agree with my other panelists. You know, for, 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 for me, uh, so much is at stake. I mean, Women Against the Recall started uh, with the leadership of Congresswoman Barbara Lee and Karen Bass around a conversation about making sure that, uh, that um, 
uh, when Kamala Harris went to the, the, the White House, that there was representation, a woman of color, a black woman in, in, in the Senate. And we wanna make sure that we focused on that, but we pivoted as a group because we recognized that um, women and women of color are gonna play a key role and we needed to defend um, uh, uh, the governor and make sure that the recall's not successful. He's not replaced even for a year uh, uh, by one of the yahoos on that long list uh, on the ballot that I just received. We wanna make sure that, um, uh, that Governor Newsom, as has been said before, is in the position to appoint uh, if there's an opportunity, a, um, a, a senator as well as the judicial and other uh, positions. So it was, it was first and foremost about promoting representation and um, we want him to be in a position to continue to do that. Uh, but there are other issues that are highly motivating for women of color. Many have been, have been talked about. Um, the really profound um, uh, uh, commitment to housing, um, to uh, rental uh, renters assistance, and to other things. Those are fundamental issues that really speak to women of color and are the reasons why we need to have that uh, continuity uh, that continues. I mean, we still are facing, um, uh, because of the Delta variant, uh, we need consistency in terms of dealing with the public health crisis that we're in, as well as the economic crisis uh, that many, many of our communities are in. So I think for all of those reasons, uh, getting out the vote for women of color is about making that argument. And I don't care if they're a declined state or, or a Democrat, we need to let people know uh, that it's at stake. The other thing is many people aren't aware is that of the long list of people that are trying to replace Newsom, um, someone could get a very, very low, like 5% of the vote, 15% of the vote. And um, you know, we could wake up on the 15th of September with a, a Trump ally as governor of, of the great state of California. We just simply cannot allow that to happen um, because it, this, you know, this part of their national strategy to create chaos and threats to our health and safety and economy and democracy. These are the messages that women of color, particularly young women of color need uh, to hear that we are recognized as um, an important drivers. And I think what we're, what we're doing with Women Against the Recall is um, convening and coordinating with the 70 member uh, uh, groups who have GOTV efforts and to get our people out. We're not doing persuasion, we're doing education and getting people when they get that envelope to vote no and then turn that thing back in. We know it's gonna be a low voter turnout election, but I think your, um, uh, the observation about the focus on um, really engaging women of color, particularly young women of color is gonna be, gonna be key in those next few weeks. Thank you, Amy. Um, I'm seeing a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, yes, uh, there are a lot of groups who are doing the ground game in these different regions. Um, several of them are here on this panel. So I encourage you to, to look into these organizations. Um, Lisa, thank you for attending in Alliance San Diego uh, Mobilization Fund. Um, if folks are interested, please do share other alternatives as well. There are a lot of groups, and I would say especially um, groups of color who are really focused on turning out young voters, uh, voters of color, and especially that nexus, um, young voters of color in this election. Um, they, they need volunteers, but also they need uh, resources as well. Um, and these are voters that they've been engaging on an ongoing basis year round, year to year. So these are trusted messengers uh, in the community and folks that I would want to have talking about the recall. Because again, this is a very hot button issue. People feel all kinds of ways about Governor Gavin Newsom but they really care and listen to these trusted messengers. So again, you know, Vanya, Amy, Matt, Jairo, these are all people who, when they speak to their communities, these are the, the folks that are, are highly respected. And so that's why we wanted you guys to be able to have a chance to hear from them tonight. Um, but we also wanna encourage folks of like, if you need, you know, talking points, these sorts of things, several of these organizations have put together um, press releases, communications toolkits, they have some uh, some resources on their website and so does Courage California as well. So there's a lot of tools, there's a lot of language out there. Um, and so I suggest you you look out there because there is some materials out there. It's 
unfortunately not gaining as much uh, attention necessarily as the Newsom campaign or the Republican candidates. Um, but, you know, we can be the ones to change that. So I want to close this panel out with a final question to all of you. So again, you're seeing a lot of these questions uh, happening in the chat. So if you could speak just really quickly about what is your organization doing against the recall and what is your call to action to Californians? And Matt, I'll start with you. Yes. So we're doing some expenditure campaigns and some special dis in some districts that we feel like will be critical um, that are going to just kind of remind people to get out the vote. Again, this is a get out the vote effort, not a persuasion effort. We're also going to be doing some um, texting and um, uh, field get out the vote efforts, especially in the IE and the Central Valley. Um, and then uh, are specifically targeted to BIPOC young voters um, in those places who aren't as frequent voters. Um, and then the other thing I was going to say, the call to action is um, what I see a lot of people in the chat saying is like, well, give us marching orders, give us something to do to help get out the vote. It, that, that's what it is. Like the point of us sharing this information is like to equip you with knowledge that you can tell people who are like, we're, we're not sure what the consequences are. Well, this is the consequences, right? And, and and sign up with one of our organizations, reach out to us, reach out to an organization in your in, in your county, your neighborhood um, to, to do that work. And they will give you what you need to go knock on doors and or call, text people. Um, and that's what I think we need to do. Um, I And to this point, I hope it's not a low turnout election. I'm actually seeing a lot of enthusiasm grow over the last two weeks, especially seeing people who haven't been as engaged politically starting to like really care about this. I'm like, oh, wow, I have a hope that it will be much better turnout than what we anticipated two weeks ago. Thank you, Matt. Um, and I forgot to mention too, at the end of this call, we are gonna have a set of partners who are doing uh, the groundwork out there. And they are ones who are taking on volunteers as we speak. So some of them are active, some of them are ramping up to get started um, this weekend. So you'll have an opportunity to do that. And we'll also share their contact information on the screen. Um, next, I, I do wanna turn it over to Vanya, same to you, like what is Inland Empire United doing around uh, the recall? And then what is your call uh, to action to Californians? Um, yeah, and I think it's the same thing. I think we're, we're aware um, that this is when it's normally a low turnout, this, this voting is not a high profile voting unless you're watching this governor recall. And so we think it's galvanized a lot of people to come out to vote in favor of the recall and we have to work as hard or harder to get people to come out and vote against it. So having said that, um, what we're doing, so IE United, uh, the board is made up of representatives um, that are there representing themselves, but many, many of us have ties to other organizations. And so the organization that I'm part of, we're able to do GOTV work, we're able to do educational work. And we have teams of folks who are doing that work. And if anyone's interested, I'm dropping in the chat our email if you wanna reach out and be a part of this work. And then I would encourage you or put out this challenge, whether you're part of an organization or a campaign, all of us know people, we're connected to people, challenge yourself to reach out and get as many people as you can to, to make sure they get out to actually vote. That's what it comes down to. We can talk a, a good game, but you know what are we gonna do and how many people are we gonna get to do it? Um, so that's the challenge. Great, thank you, Vanya and Jairo. So for our part, you know, like we're really looking to like work with like our partners here like in Orange County to do like get out the vote. Um, I think like right now, like we're gonna be focusing like mostly on phone banking. And then like, as far as like us, like as, a, as an organization, you know, like working with young people, uh, we really want our members to be like the messenger. So we're, um, you know, so like we're planning like a series of like op-eds like uh, that we're gonna be publishing like here in Orange County, uh, being written like by our members um, around like, you know, some of like the issues that we've been discussing and really like letting our members, letting like the young people be like their own like best messengers. Thank you, Jairo and Amy. I'd, um, in addition uh, to, to those things I dropped, um, two of our many links and, you know, join Women's March uh, or the um, California Democratic Party's phone banks, you can sign up. Uh, President Biden just came out in support of, of the governor. Um, we can tap a national network as well. So um, for your friends who might live outside of California, um, they can help with phone banking and things like that to help us reach our our folks. Uh, finally, the most concrete thing you can do 
is get your closest 10, 25 people to actually turn in that ballot and just have them to vote uh, no on the first question, don't vote on the second and put that thing in the mail. And um, we need to get votes as early as possible um, because um, I agree with the governor, I think it's gonna be over by the 14th, um, it'll be decided. And so um, the sooner that we can do that, uh, the better. And I think the LA region received their ballots and uh, uh, Bay Area and other, other places are starting to receive ballots. So now, now is the time uh, to do that outreach. So phone banking and text banking are the most powerful. So just pick one and sign up. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Vanya. Thank you, Jairo. Thank you for speaking on this panel. But of course, the bigger thank you is thank you for all the hard work you're doing. I love working with you. <laughs> and I'm I'm really happy to be working alongside with uh, alongside of you to defeat this recall. And then very shortly after that, we are rolling right into 2022. But uh, for now, uh, we'll 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 focus on the task at hand, which is to keep Governor Newsom in office and defeat this uh, this recall. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, so now I would like to introduce our next speaker, um, San Diego Supervisor Nora Vargas. So Supervisor Vargas was elected last year as the first Latina, first immigrant, and first woman of color in the history of the San Diego County Board of Supervisors. She was elected as the vice chair and serves as a co-chair of the county's COVID-19 subcommittee. Prior to becoming supervisor, she was an elected member and president of the Southwestern College Governing Board Vice President of Community and Government Relations at Planned Parenthood of the Pacific Southwest, and it has 25 years of experience in community work. And no surprise, she serves on the board of several organizations. Um, Super Supervisor Vargas, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you for having me. I want to make sure that technology is working here. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to be here with all of you, and thank you for all of the panelists right now and for the information. I think. Uh, the information from data for social good, I think is so critical for us to be able to uh, use this data to make sure that we are getting out there and talking to our communities. And I just think it's uh, so important that we are polling uh, our young people because often folks say that, you know, people don't want to get engaged or they don't know what's happening. And the truth is, is our young communities are much more engaged than people actually um, give them credit for and they are the ones uh, making the changes in our communities as we speak. And so to me, uh, it, I am just grateful. You know, I'm an organizer at heart and that's the world that I come from. And when I think about uh, this recall, I'm really, really frustrated and upset because, you know, I just won an election in November, 2020. A lot of folks said it couldn't be done. And yes, I'm really proud to be the first Latina, the first woman of color, um, a progressive, uh, Fronteriza, the only financial person on the Board of Supervisors, que habla español. Um, and I won, I won this race in the middle of a pandemic, and we did it because we organized our communities and we knocked on doors and we did everything we needed to do because we knew how this pandemic was impacting particularly the Latino community in San Diego, California, across the state, but particularly in San Diego, California. And I have to tell you um, that I'm really upset that the Republicans are making us spend all this money on a recall when we should be investing the money on figuring out how we make sure we focus on economic prosperity for our communities. We still aren't out of the uh, out of our COVID pandemic. And, and I'm concerned about our communities right now. People are hungry, people are being evicted from their houses. You know, um, people are, are not healthy. We're trying to figure out how to get people vaccinated. And, and these Republicans want us to, you know, focus on something that's different, but you know what? I'm committed 100% to voting no on this recall and making sure that our governor uh, continues to stay. Because let me tell you, you know, I ran as a community organizer for healthcare advocacy with a platform to make sure that people had access to healthcare, housing, right to shelter, climate, environmental justice, uh, and really a positive community, you know, safety and women's equity and justice. And and I have to say that you know, January 4th, I got sworn in. And within the first couple of weeks, I had already been working for the, with the governor's office to put pressure on them to make sure that we had more vaccines um, in San Diego. The governor came, he made sure that we, you know, I took him to Barrio Logan where Chicano Park is. He had never been there before. Um, took him to the small businesses so that he can see where the monies were going so that our small businesses could stay afloat. 
He made sure that we got extra uh, vaccines for our African-American community and making sure that we were in the churches. He made sure that we got extra vaccines so that um, our Catholic churches and our churches in the Latino community where people were, you know, felt uh, okay and they trusted, um, you know, these locations, they were able to go that. And all of these things happened because the governor and his team listened. I advocated for promotora programs uh, and to make sure that we had money and they paid attention. And, you know, um, I want to do my part because he's been doing his part and we need to defeat this recall because we want to stay on track. We've only just begun for the great things that need to happen in this state. Um, we've been, I mean, I've been on the front lines in San Diego on issues of air pollution. I'm the chair of the air pollution control district in San Diego. We have some huge issues, issues around the Tijuana River Valley and contamination um, in our communities. We know that our medical, that our healthcare system has failed us. And so really putting pressure on, on, on you know, and really working in partnership with the governor to make sure that, that things change is really what's going to make a difference. And so you know, when I ran, I ran uh, on the fact that our students at the Southwestern College, you know, I was a community college trustee and I worked for Planned Parenthood as uh, as an executive for about 20 years. And I knew, you know, our communities were hungry and we needed to make a, a difference. And I really, really have to say that the governor has been a true partner. Governor Newsom um, has been a partner to our communities and he's not perfect. But let me tell you, these Republicans who are on that ballot, they are you know, we just got, we're starting to clean up the mess that Trump did in the last, you know, four years. And we are barely trying to figure out how to get this done. I mean, I could tell you we had, you know, over 2,600 young girls, you know, at our convention center who had been in deplorable conditions, um, you know, in, 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 in um, our facilities, deportation facilities. And so, you know, there's just so much work to be, be, be done. And so, for me, I think that what we need to do is we cannot afford a Republican governor. This governor, um, we can continue to hold him accountable, work with him. He listens and he understands the power of our communities. And so I want to make sure that that um, we get him reelected. And so, you know, as somebody who's dedicated my life to serving our communities, uh, I know hard work is what is going to take uh, to make sure that we continue uh, to move forward. I want to make sure that uh, we continue to work with him, um, his team members, right? A lot of the team members are folks who have been from the community. Um, uh, people who are heading up his administration are folks who come from, from community who are actually understand the power of the work that needs to be done. And so, you know, he's led us to some really hard times. And, and you know, being an elected official right now is not easy. And you know what? That's my job. My job is to make hard decisions and not everybody's gonna like you and we get that. But what we need to do is what's right, not only short-term and long-term and he's been doing that and he does it based on science, he does it based on data and he does it based on what is best for our communities as a whole. And he's taken some really you know, uh, bold uh, steps to ensure that people have access to funding, right? Um, whether it's through our um, unemployment opportunities, the small business grants, um, just, just really, really um, doing the right thing. And so I want to make sure uh, that we can continue the fight. And I will, I do want to say that um, para mí es muy importante que como nos comuniquemos con nuestras comunidades que hablan español también, porque las comunidades latinas han estado sumamente impactadas por el COVID. Ya teníamos muchas situaciones muy difíciles mucho antes de que empezara COVID. Y ahora estamos aquí y tenemos la oportunidad de, de, de votar para en contra del recall para que se pueda quedar el gobernador y podamos seguir trabajando con él porque él ha hecho mucho trabajo que ha sido impactante para nuestras comunidades entonces uh, you know so today tonight I really want to urge all of you I mean I think all of you know how to do this all of you are here because you care uh, but we can't go backwards we uh, have to make sure we put our communities uh, uh, you know at the forefront uh, there's a lot of risk uh, in ensuring uh, if we don't have him get reelected. So I, I mean, it, if we make sure that the, the recall doesn't doesn't pass. And so please uh, vote no on the recall. Yes to progress, yes to equity, and yes, equity, and yes to uh, all of us in California so that we can make sure that we thrive and that progressive policies that I am fighting for, I'm going to be able to partner up with Governor Newsom so our communities have a better opportunity uh, to move forward. And if I learned anything from the pandemic and running a campaign 
a really, really tough campaign. Uh, you all can go back and look at, at how hard, hard it was this race. And when people said that I couldn't do it, I'll tell you, we did it based on community and knocking on doors uh, through the pandemic, getting on the phone, telling our tios, our tias, our abuelitas to get out there and vote and why this mattered. And I see, and I think, you know, to the point of the previous panelists, we are the influencers. We are the people who make a difference. You don't have to be an elected official to be able to move our communities. All of you, you know, organizers who have the corazón and the heart to make a difference in our communities, this is the time for us to put pressure, um, you know, uh, out there and to make sure that our communities uh, get out and vote. So I am um, so happy to be here and let's go win this and, and fight um, these you know, Trumpist and let them sh let's show them that in California, this nonsense is not going to be acceptable. Thank you, Supervisor Vargas. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your partnership. I, I know um, several of our San Diego partners have spoken really highly about you. We're really excited when you were elected. You. Um, and of course, we want to, to make sure you have all the tools and resources to govern well. And of course, that includes Governor Gavin Newsom as a, as a partner, as a governor. Um, so thank you to you. And next, I want to introduce our next speaker, Assemblymember Alex Lee from the 25th Assembly District, which includes parts of Alameda and Santa Clara counties. Um, Courage California, we actually endorsed Assemblymember Lee in 2020, and we're working with him on some important progressive legislation like getting um, uh, corporate money out of uh, state political campaigns. And we endorsed Alex Lee uh, because he just has always been a champion on a bold progressive agenda and is very unapologetic about it. Um, so prior to serving as an assembly, assembly member, he worked on policy and legislation for both the California State Senate and Assembly. Um, assembly member Lee, thank you for speaking with us tonight. Good to see you. Well, good, good to see you too. And thank you for having me on to talk about the recall, something that I can tell you is occupying uh, a lot of space and attention in California politics to the point that it is uh, very, very annoying. Uh, so, you know, I think the, to, to the point where a lot of our speakers have already made is how how important the recall election is right now and how important it is not to have a Republican, uh, even if it is just for a year, how important it is to not have that. Every single voter in California who is registered voter right now will get their mail-in ballot starting in the next you know couple of days or so to, to, until September 14th. You will get that. And it is so important to vote in this election because it is, unlike any other election, it is just a simple turnout game. It's not the normal kind of cycles. And I saw something today which was very interesting. Um, and I think this is an interesting narrative. And I this is kind of my like sadistic hobby of watching an alt-right what they do. And I'm very interested in seeing what their messaging is like. But the Republicans have constantly said this, the Republican governors have constantly said this thing where they're not running against each other, they're running against Gavin, right? And some of the people on in like uh, political observers or myself will say, that's kind of weird, you know, isn't it technically running against each other to be to be governor? But it's actually true, right? Because the more Republican big things jump in, they drive more and more turnout. That's their secret sauce. That's how they're trying to win. They want more and more people to vote, especially people who are Republican or Trump fans to vote, right? While they rely on uh, progressive voters or Dem voters to sit out on it. This is unlike any other election in that sense, where it's all about who can generate more voters in this sense in a very strange time. And, you know, we can hope, hopefully it will be a good turnout. But even with the special elections in the assembly where I serve, uh, the turnout has been pretty low, even with all mail, mail in ballots has been actually pretty low, even for districts that historically are pretty engaged. So we are we cannot understate the 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 fatigue of voters, the attention of voters, and of course, like the random time of year it is in September. We cannot underestimate that, and that's why it's so important to tell your friends, tell your family, like there's something going on right now. This piece of mail you got, that's a ballot. You know, like it's something that's actually happening, and why it's important. Let's also tell you what's at stake here. Even though we have a Democratic supermajority in the Senate and the Assembly in the state legislature, the governor still controls the entire executive branch. So if you have known anyone or you personally have had trouble with unemployment, the EDD department, they now, a Republican administration now controls that. They'll then control all the other departments that control uh, everything that we pass as laws and execute them. And they can basically say, we won't do those things. That's why it's so incredible that they could just reverse what they, we do on climate, reverse what we do on workers' rights, simply by not even doing it. So they don't technically break any laws. You can just not do something even for a year. And that could set us back a lot. As we learned from the Trump administration time, simply not doing anything, especially during a crisis, has a lot of harm. And that is really what's at stake here. And they could really radically change the course of um, 
a lot of things. And if there are any bills that you've been advocating for as well, things from criminal justice reform space to workers' rights or to the climate, and that we really work really hard to pass, it could pass and then it could get vetoed by a Republican governor and might not get revived by, uh, by our legislation, unfortunately. So those are the all things that are at stake. And really having California's blue led by Republican and dismantled for a while has irreparable harm because other states, I can tell you from indirect my colleagues from other states, they watch what we do and it sets such a precedent where then maybe they will inspire the Republicans and the alt-right of the other states to do similar things to take over, right? We have seen in the news over and over again, there are right-wing militia, white supremacist groups that have plotted to kidnap their governors and do other things. But now this is to take the governorship by legal means. And obviously, I think our reform process, I'm sorry, our recall process needs some reform. Uh, it was created 100 years ago, granted. But, um, you know, I, like, again, to explain to people, this is a, unlike any election, because it's a predicated two question series, you never have anything like this before, you don't say, you know, if you vote for this person president, who do you want for, I don't know, like Secretary of State or something, right? This is really the two part question that is tripping people up a lot. So when you vote, yeah, um, <clears throat> when you vote no on the recall, it is your personal choice whether or not you want to vote for anyone on the second question. Uh, the official governor's uh, campaign, they advise you not to put anyone, uh, but that's putting all our eggs in the no in no column. So that's really your personal choice. But really, as long as you vote in the no column and we we win that one, that's all right. I mean, once we once we pass 50 percent on the yes side, it's all kind of like, you know, Wild West, ultimately, which can also be a nightmare when you think about it is technically anyone, Republican or a Democrat or any other uh, governor candidate running could win with say 200 votes. It's just whoever has the most, just period. There's no runoff, there's no second round, it's just it. And they immediately become governor, essentially immediately become governor. So that's really what's at stake here. And if you have a lot of, you know, if you have problems or you have mis misgivings about this governor as I do, you know, this is not the time to air those things. We have 2022, we have the normal process to figure that stuff out right now it's kind of like disaster mode and really as we are ramping up our response to the delta variant and the new pandemic you know situation we're in we don't really want a governor that literally is making anti-masking and anti-vaccine their hallmark as we see the republicans sue and think about that again you know a republican with these beliefs who has the power to enact these things or at least just not do things that need to be done is very scary to me. And that's why it's so important to vote. So when you get that piece of paper in the mail, tell your friends, your family, like you actually got to fill this out and send it in. It is literally free and you get it in the mail. You don't got to go anywhere. And it takes like two seconds, literally, because it's only one side this time. So do what you can. You can save democracy, literally. It's only six minutes. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Assemblymember Lee. And while we have you, uh, there was a question that came in the QA that was specific to you. Um, of course, in the original language of the recall petition, the, the petition supporters were actually calling out specifically um, Governor Newsom's moratorium on the death penalty. Um, and so one of our participants really wanted to hear from you, like how do you wanna speak specifically to sort of the death penalty and sort of the consequences on this recall as well? Uh, so, I mean, yes. Yeah, so I, I think what it's stemming from is that, you know, we recently, four, six years ago, as the state of California, very confusingly, also by the ballot, voted on the death penalty, right? And then the voters voted uh, to essentially uphold death penalty, even though then the governor, Governor Newsom, came in very early, and I agree with this, is he basically essentially, right, as the power of the governor, stopped having executions. Uh, this is on the flip side, again, just like a gov Republican governor can, you know, with you know, there is law and there is acting upon the law, right? The governor, the administration, executive branch acts on the law, so he can change it differently. Um, obviously, the proponents um, of the recall are probably genuinely also very pro-death penalty and killing more people in the judicial system. So it's not a surprise they bring that up. But that was always an early gripe where um, I guess I guess I'm explaining for historical context, but people were always people were gripe, uh, central people on the right were always griping about executive overreach, like his ban on electric vehicles, I'm sorry, his ban on combustion engine vehicle sales, which we did uh, two years ago, which a lot of us agree on and want to do, but of course is slightly controversial from a executive power standpoint. Um, but those are all the things people throw in, right? Like when someone overreaches, overreaches or does something they don't like, they'll pin it on something like that. So it just happens all the time. Thank you, Assembly Member Lee. And then one final question I have for you. I mean, you've, you've really put yourself out there. I think we've even seen with 
um, candidates who have been running in different races, they look to you as sort of like the progressive beacon in the state legislature. You mentioned, of course, you're, you are left of the governor um, very clearly. And we've definitely seen some hesitation or some pushback from folks who I would say want the governor to, to do more or are, are upset with him. Um, coming more from the left. So what, how is it that you're speaking to people um, specifically who want to see the governor do more are really unhappy because they feel like he's not doing a good job um, from the left, more progressive flank of the Democratic Party? Yeah, I mean, I always say is, you know, whatever problem you with Gavin Newsom, this, this unfortunate, this recall is a binary choice of do you want Gavin or something objectively worse than Gavin? That's just, that's just frankly it. You know, if you are upset about him not doing enough in social, in, um, in justice reform or about, uh, taxing the wealthy, which he has opposed me on, uh, you know, I can guarantee you Larry Elder or all these other people are also going to fight me even harder on these things. And they're going to do as much uh, damage, if not more. Um, so that's just the reality right here. It's an imperfect part of this quirk of our democratic process where it is a binary choice. It is status quo or worse. It is not in this case, status quo or better question mark. It is status quo or worse. That is what you're picking at. It is an unfortunate binary decision you're at. And that's what I tell people. And it's really up to you, right? Do you really want something that is worse than now? And that's it. That is, that is the question. That's really technically what the question is at this point. Yes. Thank you so much, Assembly Member Lee. Thank you for joining us tonight. And also, of course, thank you for your leadership in Sacramento and around the state. We will be in touch, of course, um, as we continue to move things in the state legislature, because legislature has some work there to do as well. <laughs> so thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. So now I want to move us to the Q&A section and answer some of the questions. I know we've been seeing some um, in the Q&A section, but I also encourage you too, to also put some in the chat as well. Um, so definitely the one I keep seeing very consistently is I know folks have a lot of questions on what to do about question number two on the ballot. So I just want to reemphasize on the ballot, there's just going to be two questions that folks have to answer. The first is whether or not you would vote to remove, recall the governor and remove him from office. And then the second question is going to ask, um, who would you want to replace uh, the governor? So to be clear, regardless of how you vote on the first question, you can answer the second question. Uh, and then another point of clarity is that when they count the ballots, they're gonna count the ballots on the first question first. Um, so if, if more than 50% of voters vote to recall the governor, then it goes into counting the second, the votes on the second question to determine who has the most votes. So as has been mentioned before, whoever has the most votes what? just becomes the next governor. So they can have a much smaller percentage uh, than obviously the governor, that Governor Newsom won um, to win the seat in 2018. So that is the danger of this. And that's why I think several folks have been pointing out in the chat. Um, and as was highlighted in a New York Times um, editorial or op-ed that there's really questionable uh, things about this process. It seems very undemocratic because we could be electing our next governor with us, you know, with single digit support. So, as you know, in the original recall in 2003, uh, the Lieutenant Governor Cruz Bustamante ran, um, and there are debates as to whether or not him running actually drew and attracted more people to actually recalling Governor Gray Davis. And of course, as we know, um, Cruz Bustamante did not win enough votes to, uh, to win the governorship and it ended up going to Governor Schwarzenegger. So in this year, the Democrats were really, uh, they kept things really tight. So they ended up essentially keeping any particularly viable qualified Democrat from running on this for the second question on the ballot. So when it comes to answering the second question, I think as Amy has mentioned, most groups, the, most groups, the Newsom campaign and the Democratic Party are advocating that people just vote no and not vote on the second question. However, and that is something that Courage is, in, uh, is advocating for as well. However, I know that people don't like feeling like they don't have a vote that counts on the second question. So in terms of the second question, I wanna say, um, as Alice had mentioned, you, you either have Republicans who have held elected office before, and we know where they stand on things in opposition to a lot of what we believe in, 
or you have a lot of candidates who have never held elected office before, um, haven't been involved in politics, haven't even been involved in their communities very much. So it's very dangerous because the slate of candidates, there is no, there is no one who stands out, who will be viable, who will be more progressive, or who will deliver on what we want from Governor Gavin Newsom. Right now, Larry Elder, of course, the uh, conservative talk show host, he is polling really well and there is more and more momentum building behind him. So the likelihood of somebody else on the ballot, either a Democrat or a Green Party candidate or somebody else of your choice, being able to overcome a Larry Elder or any of the other um, top Republican candidates is very unlikely. So with that said though, I encourage folks, if you really want to vote on the second question, do your due diligence, do your research to find out who these candidates are and make your selection based on who you think um, you would trust to govern this state. Um, and that's what I will say about that. Um, I do wanna mention that a lot of these candidates don't even have a campaign website or much on, on the internet. So you might not be able to find out a whole lot of information about them. So do your research and um, find out what makes sense for you on that second question. Uh, let's see. Sorry, and then related, I saw some folks had some questions on, in terms of the second question, so there are 46 candidates who are running on the ballot. So there are no uh, possibilities for writing in candidates. You can only vote for the certified list of 46 candidates. So any writing candidates will be thrown out. So I saw some folks that sort of mentioning this idea of um, potentially writing in Lieutenant Governor um, Kunalakis and you could, um, it just won't count for anything, unfortunately. Uh, then, sorry, let's see. Then I think in terms of what Alex Lee said, I see another question is like, what would you say to friends who, have, who say the governor has not met the moment or, or delivered uh, what we need? I would say that there are definitely, as Supervisor Vargas said, we do want to keep pushing Governor Newsom and we want to keep holding him accountable, but that door is still open with him and he is actively working with our groups to keep pushing. Um, so even if you're unhappy with him, at least he is working with the trusted groups um, and the trusted messengers here on this call. With the Republican candidates, we know that they're going to be talking to a very uh, different set of organizations and they're going to be pandering to their base as well. And so it's going to be a very different kind of agenda. And instead of having somebody we can continue to push to go forward, we're going to have people like Larry Elder is saying that there are some things that he wants to roll back um, immediately. He's the one who's who's out there promoting that he thinks the minimum wage should be zero dollars. So again, very, very stark difference. As Assembly Member uh, Lee mentioned, this is going to be a situation of you have Governor Gavin Newsom or worse. Um, and that is the, the black and white and very stark choice. Um, so uh, I just want to be mindful there are a few more questions please continue to write some in the chat and in the q a um, some of my colleagues are actually answering the questions there i do want to leave some time because it seems like of course there's been a lot of enthusiasm from all of you to hear from partners and understand what's happening on the ground and the ways that you can be connected thank you to those of you who have been dropping some of the resources and links in the chat so folks can figure out where to sign up um so now i want to really turn it over to some of our partners. And to put things in context, um, we're gonna hear from several of our partners who are doing uh, work around different issues um, in different ways. And we're also gonna be hearing from the Newsom campaign as well. Um, and I wanna emphasize too, the reason why we're having all these folks on is of course we need to cover as many voters around the state as possible. But as was mentioned before, right, different messaging is gonna hit with different voters. We just need as many voters as possible to turn out to vote and vote no on the recall. So the more times people hear the messages, the better, and the more we can put out messages that speak to different people about the things they care about, the better. And so that's why we wanted to invite this, this group of folks on. So I just want to uh, mentioned really quickly so for, on the C3 side. So again, nonpartisan, this is just about getting out the vote. Um, we're gonna hear from Juan Rubalcaba at ACE and Oyama Obekia from Black Women for Wellness Action Project. Then on the C4 side, which is of course where you can do more work and talk about um, actual no on the recall. We're gonna hear from Gina Moore from NARAL Pro-Choice California and Lindsay Hopkins and Eric Alfaro from the Newsom Stop the Republican Recall campaign. 
Um, so first, Juan, I want to turn it over to you. If you want to do a quick summary of you know the kind of work that you're doing and how uh, folks can volunteer and turn out to help help you guys turn out more voters around the state. Yeah, thanks, Irene. Um, like Irene said, I'm with ACE, which is on the slide right there in front of y'all. That's the Alliance of Californians for Civic. <laughs> Uh, Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment is actually what it's supposed to be. Although civic empowerment is definitely what we're talking about today. Um, we are gonna be doing phone banking, uh, which you can do remotely, even though we have locations in these areas here that's listed on the slide. Um, definitely hit me up if you're interested in doing that kind of phone banking. Um, we, If you are near one of our offices, you can also do some door knocking. I feel like what's missing here is also we're going to be doing outreach in the city of Antioch in Contra Costa. So, um, you know, hoping to get out the vote in communities that are working class, immigrant, black and brown, uh, target folks who don't usually go out and vote as often, just really doing that turnout. Thank you, Juan. Um, Oyama? Thank you, Irene. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Irene, for the space and for inviting us to share um, the work that we're doing. Uh, my name is Onyamo Viekia, as was previously mentioned, and I'm with Black Women for Wellness and Black Women for Wellness Action Project. And we are, um, we have a 501c3 and a 501c4 wing, and our focus, we are committed to the well-being um, and building the power of Black women and girls throughout the state of California. And so that is our population, that is our focus and our target. Um, so on the C3 side, um, BWW will engage in GOTV efforts through phone banking, canvassing, texting, and house parties. Um, so we welcome volunteers to join our canvassing, phone banking, and house party efforts. Um, so of course, my information is right here, so contact or here. <laughs> contact me. Um, and we're also running ad campaigns um, that are C3 compliant, of course, um, and you'll see them in bus shelters throughout Los Angeles and wild postings throughout LA and the San Francisco Bay Area. But as far as our um, what we need help with or who, you know what we'd like volunteers for, um, for canvassing, um, we love, love, love volunteers to join us um, as we canvass the second supervisorial district, which is um, particularly focusing in South Los Angeles. And then as for phone banking and texting, we welcome volunteers for that as well. Um, and our focus um, areas are, or regional focuses are Los Angeles, Palmdale, Lancaster, Stockton, Fresno, um, and Oakland and the Bay Area. So, um, Please, if you are interested in joining us and volunteering with our organization, um, we welcome you. Just send me an email and we will move forward from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anyama. And then apologies, Tima. Tina, I forgot to mention you in the quick introduction. Um, next, I want to turn it over to Tina McKinner, who's Deputy Director at LA Voice Action to talk about their outreach efforts. Tina? Yes, good afternoon. Excuse me for my voice, you guys. I have a little bit of laryngitis. Um, LA Voice Action is a faith-based faith organization that supports leaders that govern with the moral compass. We will call over 100,000 voters that we have contacted with for, for over a year and a half. Um, we've talked to these voters about everything, the census, DA education, COVID testing, COVID vaccination sites, the recall election and stop the recall on George Gascon because we have our little our problem here in LA County with the recall on George. So what LA Voice uh, Action has decided to do is to um, start our paid phone callers um, on Sunday. We'll start that. We'll do it five days a week, um, five hours a day. We'll call these hundred thousand voters back, and then we're asking volunteers to join our virtual virtual volunteer phone banking on August 4th and 5th and August 11th and 12th from two to six. Um, you can contact myself, Tina, at LA Voice Action to help lavoiceaction.org to help us out. We, we believe that actually, you know, sitting down, talking to the voters, especially after they've been educated by us about the recall for the past three months to now just come in on the C4 side and ask them to vote no on the recall is right on time. We feel like we can move these 100,000 100, voters to the, to the polls and to vote no, and especially with your help 
in our on our volunteer days. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Uh, and next, we'll hear from Gina from Nero Pro Choice California. Gina. Hi everyone, my name is Gina Moore. I am the California Organizing Manager for NARAL Pro Choice California. We are an advocacy and uh, political reproductive rights organization. Um, we know that many, many Californians, 90% of women in California, cite reproductive freedom um, as one of their most important issues when they go to the ballot box, which is why um, every single Tuesday from now into the recall at 6 p.m., we're gonna be hosting our virtual power hours. That will be an hour of phone banking, text banking, or relational organizing. It may be a combination of many things. Um, please go to, I can put it in the chat, um, nayral.us slash CA power is where we will be every Tuesday until the recall. Um, you can also go to our link tree, which um, there may be some more uh, events to come with some other reproductive rights organizations, um, and we will post those there. But for the most part, every single Tuesday, we will be there um, making calls, sending texts, reaching out to our friends. Uh, Governor Newsom has really made good on his promise to reproductive freedom and to advance uh, and expand abortion access in the state. So um, please come, you know, come volunteer with us, come volunteer with our partners here. It is so, so important for the future of reproductive freedom here in California. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Um, and finally, I want to welcome Lindsay Hopkins and Eric Alfaro. They're from the Stop the Republican Recall campaign. Of course, that is uh, Newsom's own campaign. Uh, Lindsay and Eric, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having us today. Um, Eric and I are here with the Stop the Republican Recall. Uh, we do have a number of volunteer opportunities that are available. Uh, I do want to lift up the folks who came before us. These are all fantastic options and have always been wonderful partners. When I'm not with the Stop the Republican Recall, uh, I work for Organized Labor, I work for SEIU. Eric, uh, my colleague, also works for CTA. We know how important uh, so many of these issues are, but really what's at stake here is making sure that we stop this recall uh, and that folks vote no. In the field, we're getting a lot of feedback from folks that they're strongly against the recall, but they frankly don't know there's an election. Uh, and if they do know that there's a recall, they think it's in November. So taking the time to work with folks to get them knowledgeable about the election, whether it's through C3 or C4 work is vitally important. Uh, so my pitch today is to talk about our door knocking, phone banking and text banking operations. Eric is dropping the links in the chat if you wanna go directly there and sign up for some shifts. Um, we have partnered with the California Democratic Party to put up a dialing system. So we're gonna be dialing six days a week. Um, between now and every single day, well, every single day except for Fridays, between now and the election, we'd love for you to come out and help us. Uh, phoning is really gonna be the best way for us to have a real substantive conversations with folks during this time of COVID. Uh, we will also be doing safe door knocking practices across the state in combination with labor and with the California Democratic Party and with a number of other organizations who are interested in participating. Um, our biggest pushes are, again, are going to be phone banking. Eric dropped in the mobilize link. Eric? Yeah? Yeah, it's in. Okay, awesome. Uh, and then uh, we're going to be doing a really big push on the weekends leading up to the election, and especially the last four days, to go do ballot pickups from folks, since this is a very short ballot. Uh, we're hoping that we can have folks vote with us either on the phone or at the door and then just hand us the ballots uh, to make sure that we're getting all those votes in as quickly as possible. I'll pause there to see, Eric, do you have anything else you'd like to add? I think the only other thing is just, you know, something I like to make clear and point out is that, you know, we're not, the threat is not from the Republican side. We're, we're not dealing with the typical Republicans. We're dealing with Trump Republicans. Uh, so much is at stake. You know, if there's ever been a moment for you to kind of jump in and get involved, you know, volunteer, the, that moment is now. Uh, you know, to win, we're not gonna need a dozen volunteers. We're not gonna need hundreds of volunteers. We're gonna need thousands of volunteers. Uh, so we encourage you, sign up for a shift, volunteer, make some calls. We're going to need every single one of you uh, to win. Could 
could not have said that better myself. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Eric, Gina, Tina, Onyama, and Juan. Thank you for all the work you're doing. And I'm, I'm glad that you could join us this evening. Um, as, as they all just mentioned, we just need to reach as many voters as possible this election. So I encourage you all to sign up to volunteer with an organization or a campaign whose work and messaging really resonates with you. Um, this election is gonna come out to turn out, which again, like it's gonna depend on energy and engagement. And as you heard also, ballots are going out now. So uh, Juan even texted me the other day that um, he got the text that his ballot was coming out. And so people are actually making their choices now. So this is the time to really encourage people to say, to vote no on the recall and say yes to progress. And then, you know, as, as Lisa was saying before, and Supervisor Vargas, then it's about getting your family and your friends to turn in their no ballots and then sign up to turn out more voters. Because this is really more than just about the recall. This is a battle for the soul of our state. So we don't need to just defeat this recall for the electoral win. We need to win the hearts and minds of all Californians in pursuit of a more equitable and just California. With courage, we can defeat this recall and fight for a California that works for all of us. Thank you all for joining us. Um, turn in your ballots, get your other folks to turn in your no ballots and turn out um, and volunteer with these partners and these campaigns. We need every single no vote in. Thank you and good night.